integumentary system. As you can see from the opening slide here, the integumentary system at the very top consists of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. This is a nice slide because the burgundy layer at the bottom is your base layer where the stratum basale, the cells are constantly dividing, constantly undergoing mitosis. Therefore, they're labile cells. And as the cells go up, they start to flatten out until you get the very top layer, which we call the stratum corneum. It is full of keratin protein. They're flat and that forms the armor protection that not only keeps moisture in, but also keeps the bacteria out. As soon as the bacteria decide they want to start getting in, they take a magic carpet ride on one of those little flakes of skin and they become dust in your room. All right, there's the Oompa Loompas as they change their skin color. What does integument mean? So integument literally means to cover. So integument is our skin. The skin is the largest organ of the body outside. Internally, it's the liver. Functions of the integumentary system include, of course, I've already mentioned, diluted to the first one, is protection. <clears throat> it not only prevents dehydration, like I said, it is also our first line of defense against microbes, that is bacteria and viruses that try to get in. Most of what you look at when you look at you is dead, outer layer, keratin-filled, stratified squamous epithelial tissue, and those cells slough off constantly, daily, and they make dust in your room. Also, ultraviolet radiation. A lot of that is blocked by the melanin in our skin, so it doesn't hurt us as much. And physical attack, obviously. There's layers of protection, so when you scratch, you don't bleed. There's also sensation. We have many, many, many nerves inside our skin. They detect hot. Some are special for cold. Some are special for light. Some for deep pressure. And each hair follicle has its very own little nerve to it, so it can be sent, sense that, as well as pain. What is not listed here is, cold, is wet. So wet is a combination of cold and affluent light movement across the skin. Okay, this talks about, this little diagram shows how the sunlight, the ultraviolet rays, <clears throat> ultraviolet B, changes a precursor in our skin of cholesterol to form vitamin D with the help of your liver and your kidney. So the vitamin D precursor is, again, when the ultraviolet radiation changes the cholesterol in the superficial capillaries, and it is then moved onto the liver and kidney through the blood system liver and kidney modify it more to make vitamin D. And vitamin D is like all vitamins, it's a cofactor. Its main job is to help the body absorb calcium. So calcium absorption is very difficult for us to do without the use of vitamin D. It pretty much opens the door and lets calcium in. And here's a nice little diagrammatic scheme of how ultraviolet radiation penetrates through the upper layers of the skin and the superficial blood vessels. And it changes the precursor to vitamin D3, which then the liver and kidney modify it to make vitamin D, and that helps calcium and phosphorus absorption in the intestines and moves calcium into the bones for storage. More functions. A third function <clears throat> is also temperature regulation. Now you all know we sweat, but remember I told you the superficial capillaries in your skin, when you get embarrassed or when you get angry or when you get hot, there's little smooth muscles around those that relax and let the blood flow to the surface and lets that heat escape. On the converse, when it's cool outside and you don't want to lose that heat, those superficial muscles close and restrict those superficial blood vessels. And so the blood is not brought to the surface as much and more of the heat is kept in. So you look more pale when it's cool out. Hair follicles also have little muscle you can see attached in the diagram below called an erector pili. Pili is a hair follicle. And it pulls that pili up when it gets cold. When they flex, you get little goose bumps. You can see the little muscles flexing. Every hair follicle has one of these. <clears throat> and the purpose of that is to pull the hair follicle up so the wind, it cuts down the wind blowing away and sweeping away as much heat. And of course, sweat glands produce sweat because when you put moisture to the surface and moisture evaporates, evaporation is a cooling process. So again, to reiterate, when it's cold outside, cool, not cold, but when it's cool outside, your superficial blood vessels are constricted by the smooth muscles around them, and they keep the body heat in. When it's very cold, your very thin tissues, like your nose and your ears, 
they'll, to avoid frostbite, they will allow more blood to come to them so those superficial blood vessels open up and bring the heat so you don't lose a nose or an ear. Another function is excretion. Very minimal function, but still sweat does have a minute amount of uric acid, urea, and ammonia. And that's probably for a purpose more than excretion, but also for keeping the body clean as it's also some of those things are antimicrobial. All right, the big three main layers of your integumentary system is the skin. Skin is your integument. You got the epidermis, epi on top, dermis, and that's made of epithelial tissues. The dermis is the middle layer. It's the thick, dense layer, dermis, dense connective tissue. And then your hypodermis or your subcutaneous layer has 50% of the body's fat and a lot of loose connective tissue to connect the skin to the muscles and bones below. So the subcutaneous layer, as I just alluded to earlier, is a lot of loose connective tissue. And if we were dissecting cats and you pulled the skin off, you'd see this loose connective tissue is like cotton, tough cotton that holds the skin on. It does contain about 50% of the body's fat. So when you gain weight, you see it in your face, everywhere. The blood vessels and nerves are mainly through here as well. So it's highly vascularized, a lot of blood. So if you get cut down that low, there's going to be a lot of blood. The subcutaneous is also the thickest layer of skin, but on the eyelids and lips, it's missing. That's why the, you can close your eyes and see some light coming through, and your lips are pink because there's not a lot of stuff between the blood and the outer part of your lips. That's why chapped lips bleed easy. Another nice diagram. Now we come to the dermis, the middle layer. Again, I said it's made of dense connective tissue. And if you remember from the tissues, dense connective tissue is densely packed collagen fibers, very tough. This is the part of the skin which we will scrape off the subcutaneous layer and treat to make leather. So leather belts, leather boots, leather products are made from cow's dermis. Within the dermis, macrophages, that is white blood cells that can come out and eat, the big eaters, they'll sneak out of the blood vessel and go in there and eat any bacteria that happen to make it through. You have a bunch of small capillaries feeding the base layer of your epidermis, but also feeding everything else in the dermis. Remember, pretty much every cell is fed by a close capillary, a little bit of blood. There's nerve endings in the dermis, a lot of nerve endings. You can scratch the epidermis and it doesn't hurt much because there's not nerves up there. The nerves are down in the dermis. There are smooth muscles, hair follicles, and then your sweat glands and your sebaceous glands. Every hair follicle has a sebaceous gland producing sebum, an oil that lubricates the hair follicles and keeps them supple so they don't break and fall off. And of course, lymph vessels. Now, lymph is the way of taking that fluid that seeped out of the blood to feed the cells. It has to go back into the lymph. Now it's called lymph. And the lymph then is pushed by your muscles to squish that fluid back into the blood. So it just fluid that goes from the blood to the tissues to the lymph back to the blood. Dermal papillae are little, the word papillae, like bumps, little bumps of the dermis protruding up into the epidermis. So there's a little bump down here, this little bump down here. It's called the dermal papillae. Dermal papillae are responsible for fingerprints, footprints. Now the epidermis, the top layer, the thinnest layer, it is made mainly of stratified squamous epithelium. What you're looking at there is someone's belly button, and even the belly button, all the skin you see is stratified squamous epithelium. Again, mitosis is constant at the stratum basale, your base layer. Stratum, layer, basale, base. It literally means base layer. You've got regeneration of stratified squamous epithelial cells going on there. Constant regeneration as they go to the top, they flatten out, and they slough off. The very top layer is called the stratum corneum, or the horny layer, because it's horn, like the horns of a cow are also made of keratinized protein, kind of like our hair. So the keratin protein is, fills up the cells, and they flatten out, and you get a 
flat layer to stratum corneum. Down in the base layer, you've got melanocytes. Site means cell. Melano refers to melanin. These are cells that produce melanin, our pigment, to help us protect us against ultraviolet radiation and gives us our dark color. All right, then. Layers of the epidermis is seen here. So here's a nice little slide of the stratified squamous epithelium again. Breaking it down, the stratum corneum, the top layer, and the stratum basale, the base layer, are the two layers I need you to know. Stratum lucinum, granulosum, spinosum, other layers not listed here will be talked about more when you get to college, anatomy, physiology, and they go a lot faster. All right, melanocytes, again, produce melanin, and the three different main groups of humans, according to their melanin production, is the African descent, the Asian descent, and the European descent. And you can see the European descent produces less melanocytes, probably because they got less exposure to the sun over all the years. Skin color can also be changed by other things other than melanin. Now, the hormones in pregnant women can produce increased melanin production. Therefore, that's called the mask of pregnancy. But when you get angry, when you get embarrassed, when you get an infection that causes inflammation, the blood vessels will dilate. And when the superficial blood vessels dilate, it brings more blood to the surface and you can see more redness in the skin. Hmm, we've got two hands down below. One is a person who eats a lot of carrots or sweet potatoes or something with a lot of beta carotene. The beta carotene is lipid soluble. It's a plant pigment that will gather in your extremities, in your hands. I had a young lady in class one year saw this and she said, look at my palm of my hand. And sure enough, it looked like that. It was orangish. And everyone thought she tanned. She went to the tanning booth, but she did not. She just ate a bag of carrots, a bunch of carrots, baby carrots every day for lunch. And it does build up. The German people tend to feed their children, or used to feed their babies, a lot of sweet potatoes. And the babies have that orangish color to them. So they get a free tan without going to the tanning bed. Eat a lot of sweet potatoes or carrots. Mask of pregnancy. Same lady before she's pregnant on the right, or maybe with makeup on. <laughs> it could be makeup. And the same lady on the left with the mask of pregnancy. If you zoom in, you can see a little blotching due to pregnancy hormones. All right, you get a bluish color when you're cyanotic. Cyan is blue, so cyanosis literally means a blue color. Due to the lack of oxygen in the blood, your blood is no longer bright red. It's more of a burgundy maroon color like you see in the vacutainers when they draw your blood. And our blood is not blue in the veins. It's a dark color when it's low, low in oxygen. But that dark purplish burgundy color appears blue through the collagen fibers of the skin. Your collagen diffracts the light, a lot like the atmosphere in our sky diffracts the sunlight. Our sky is not blue. Water is not blue. You look at water, it's clear, but it diffracts sunlight, causing a blue color. So therefore, blood is not blue. Birthmarks, again, are abnormal blood vessels in the superficial part of the dermis, which are not hereditary, but they are clustered, and because they're clustered and higher up, you see a lot more red there. Jaundice. You've heard of people having jaundice. It's usually due to liver problems. So your liver, again, takes the, the old red blood cells that your body uses, constantly recycling, and the bilirubin is turned to bile, and bile is used in the digestive system to emulsify fats. But if your liver is damaged, it's not taking the bilirubin and making it into bile. So bilirubin builds up, and bilirubin gets in your skin, kind of like carotene does, and it leaves a yellowish color to your skin. So you can see the gentleman on the right has a lot of yellowish in his face, the baby yellowish. It's a lot easier if you look at the whites of their eyes. You can see the yellow and the whites of the eyes a lot easier than the skin. That's the telltale sign with animals you would slightly push on their eye, upper eyelid and force the eye up so you can see the white of the eye because, of course, dogs and cats have a lot of hair. You can't see their skin. So the gentleman on the left, normal. On the right, jaundiced.
With that, we end part one.